the frack attack. It starts right here. My name is Bernard. Bernard Cohn, it's my pleasure to be up here. I'm gonna do a couple of tunes for you. The first tune, I noticed a while ago that looking at an ostrich, when an ostrich got his head in the sand, his butt's in the air, and that's not good. That can't be good, right? When your head's in the sand, your butt's in the air, you don't know nothing, you're not going nowhere. You say, leave me alone, I just want to hide, it's not my concern, I'm not that type of guy. There's a dance that goes, you put your head down in the sand, you shake your, shake your tail fast. Do the ostrich bend down low? We will fix it so you don't have to know. Woo. Now you're making your mark, you're part of the scene, but you can't stop banning to your mansion of dreams. You just want what's yours, but then you want mine. You're playing the game, you're biding your time. Do the ostrich bend down low, you know what I mean? We will fix it so you don't have to know. some hippie myth from drugs on the brain and how could anyone starve when we've got so much food i could lose a few pounds if i got in the mood to the ostrich you know what i mean bend down low we will fix it so you don't have to know but too many ostriches around do the ostrich around here, do we? We've got to get together and stop this fracking. It's just the ground that we walk on. It's just the air that we breathe. But this insanity goes on. But stronger warnings we need. Oh, what do we tell our children when their cold water just burns? How do we say we're sorry that we were so slow to learn? It's a fracking shame. It's just a fracking shame. And the land will never be the same. And there are safer ways to energy. We are the stewards. It is our job to protect when only money says do it and build a world of regret. They're making the earth shake deep in the heart of the land. We gotta stop. For our sake, for every woman and man, it's a fracking shame. It's just a fracking shame, and we're not gonna play your game. We've gotta stop it now, you and me. We gotta stop it now. I think it's fitting that we're meeting here in a church because this is a sacred mission. This fracking is an insult and injustice on every level you can think of, spiritually, psychologically. We have some rights. 
Whatever happened to zoning? What happened, happened to the idea that you could choose to live out in the country, in the rural areas, away from an industrial zone, and away from a, a, a trafficy uh, inner city if you want to? What happened to our rights to do that? Evidently, the government and the powers that be and the big oil companies, which seem to be the same, one and the same. You know what I mean? They don't seem to think that our rights mean anything. They don't seem to think that our feelings mean anything, that our health means anything, that the health of our children mean anything. Oh, we're going to tell them that's wrong. That it does mean something. We are mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and grandsons and aunts and uncles. People, human beings who feel, who think, who love, who care. We're not going to stop until they know that. We're doing a film called Groundswell, and that's what it's going to take, a groundswell. All the great movements, the environmental movement, the unions, women's rights, civil rights, all were groundswells. Started with little individual people. Check out our film, groundswellmovie.com. Take a look at what we're doing. Stay in contact. Thank you. We are the stewards. It is our job to protect. When only money says do it. We gotta stand and protest. If the fracking shame. It's just a frank and shame When nobody wants to take the blame We gotta stop it now, you and me We gotta stop it now, you and me Come on, Johnny! We gotta stop it now, you and me We will stop it now
This is the governor's number. He is at the brink of making a decision about fracking. We need to tell Governor Cuomo no fracking in New York or he will never be president of the United States. This wonderful weekend is kicking off a summer and fall of events to stop fracking. I'd like to call out the shale gas outrage Folks, please stand up so that you can answer questions, anybody who's an organizer. You may remember that last, last year in September, the fracking industry met in Philadelphia, and Philadelphia activists organized the shale gas outrage. 2,000 people took to the streets. They're doing it again this year. You need to mark the date on your calendar. The industry is going back. We need to go back to that September 20th. So it's, fa it's really, it's really, it's in Philadelphia. It's really fantastic that we're here building a movement because we have a long road ahead of us. I was recently at an industry meeting called the First Summit on Oil, Gas, and Water, and it was really a scary place. There was no talk of natural gas as a transition or bridge fuel. They intend to frack for every last drop of oil and gas. The industry was there, and they were talking about the numbers, the trillions of gallons. Every year, they said, 8.1 trillion gallons of water are used for the oil and gas industry every single day um, internationally, and a fourth of that is here in the U.S., and it's rising by 8% every year. We're not going to let that happen. And our first speaker tonight knows firsthand what happens when water is polluted. Our first speaker is John Fenton from Pavilion, Wyoming. You may recognize the name Pavilion, Wyoming, because John and other residents organized to pressure the EPA to test and investigate their water. And when the EPA came out and said fracking is a problem, the industry is putting pressure on the EPA. John, can you tell us your story? Thanks for having me here tonight. It's, it's good to see everybody from all parts of the country and people I haven't got to see for a long time. Uh, I come at this maybe from a little different perspective than most people in this room. We made our living for a while. I ran a welding business, pipelining in the gas fields in Wyoming. You know, uh, it's no different than where a lot of people are from. You do whatever you can to support your family and to make a living. And uh, you can make a lot of money doing it. We made a huge amount of money. But we're also stuck in an area where our ranch and farm that's belonged to my wife's family for 60 years now was being drilled on. And we live in an area of, of what they call split estate minerals, where someone else owns the mineral rights and we uh, have to accommodate whatever they feel like is necessary for them to extract the minerals from under us. So, uh, you know, if you were to stand where we live 10 years ago, you would think it's probably a picture postcard. To me, if I look past what's been done to it, it still is. Uh, the Wind River Mountains lay to the west of us. The Owl Creek Mountains lay to the north. We're right in the middle of the Wind River Indian Reservation. Uh, more history and more land than you could see in a lifetime. It's really a special place. And uh, it's sometimes hard to talk about because it's changed so much. As I said, we were making our living, you know, 50 bucks an hour is damn hard to turn down. So. I worked right in the very area where we lived, hooking up wells and, and doing the things that need to be done to hook up the infrastructure. And, and I saw how 
the people on the land were viewed by industry. They didn't realize that when I stopped working there, I drove two or three miles home, and my real life was raising hay and cows and my family right there in the valley that they were punching holes in. And they were disgusted by the fact that we had guts enough to live where they were drilling oil and gas and we should just get the hell out of the way and let them do what needed to be done. And I'm putting a good spin on it. There are words that I probably should repeat here, so. Uh, it, you know, we were just a, a, a hindrance to them. And we were referred to as a bunch of goddamn farmers and ranchers that just need to get out of the way and let progress happen. Well, progress happened to us. They drilled 350 feet in every direction from our home that they could drill. Within a four mile radius, we have 200 production pads and three compressor stations. Our ranch and farm, which is fairly small, we farm about 200 acres. We've got another 600 acres of what you would call desert. Kind of looks like something you'd see the Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner running through. 24 wells. Most of them I could hit with a rock from my front porch. So, you know, I saw the impacts to my neighbors. I saw water going bad. I saw animals dying. I saw a way of life that was really disappearing in a hurry. And we decided that we couldn't make our living by that anymore. And we, did, we sold the welding equipment. We went completely to agriculture. And we don't make the money we used to, but we've got a hell of a good life. And it's one worth fighting for. And I think that's why everybody here is here in this room tonight. No matter where we're from, you know, I wear this funny hat. There's people from all over the world and all over this country who are affected by this. And the important thing is, is that we set aside our differences. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or your occupation or your accent or your political affiliation. We're talking about human rights and we're talking about the very essentials of life. And unfortunately, we live in an area where our very future is at stake. My youngest son just turned 14, and his greatest wish is to continue the life that we have. And that's probably not gonna be possible. Our land's worth less than 50% of what it was 10 years ago. But for all those things that have happened, I can take some solace in the fact that it's taught me a very important lesson. I really, really know what's important now. I really know that what's happening in this room and the things that all of us fight for are the most important. Our land, our air, and our water, and our natural resources to feed ourselves, to shelter ourselves, and to raise healthy human beings. And I want you to remember something, and I don't remember where this quote comes from, and maybe I'll screw it up anyways. <laughs> Where the people lead, the leaders will follow. We are those people, and it's time that we start leading things in this country. So, thank you very much. And that's why we're all here this weekend. We want our leaders to start following the people. So I don't know how many of you saw the article in the New York Times today. It was, a, it was an article about a study in science um, done by Harvard scientists that for the first time link climate change and ozone depletion. And what's happening is all of these violent thunderstorms that we're having are sending water vapor high up into the stratosphere, which is normally as dry as a desert. And it's setting off a chain reaction that's destroying the ozone, which means more skin cancer and more problems. One more reason that we must address climate change. Our next speaker has devoted his life to the, the climate crisis and doing something about it. And he doesn't really need an introduction. His name is Bill McKibben. He wrote to, uh, Back to Nature, which was the first book at the end of the 90s that really talked about the climate crisis. He is the co-founder of 350.org, which has done events in 188 countries around the world and is leading the charge on climate change. Bill.
Well, now, thank you. I, that was very kind, and, and it's, it's really good to be here, especially good for me to get to be here actually in this church, because 11 months ago, uh, I got to spend every night almost for two weeks in this church, because this is where we were training people every night to go down and get arrested in front of the White House. And, and I know there are people here tonight who were part of that fight against Keystone, and I'm really grateful to see all. And, you know, it was quite, actually, I mean, there's a very, very good vibe in here, I think, still. Every night, people were arriving, strangers from all over the country. They'd signed up for one day in this two-week adventure. Uh, 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 and, and they were strangers, and they'd arrive, and for four hours, Duncan, who's here tonight, and Matt, and others would train them how to get arrested, which is harder than it sounds, to get arrested properly, you know? Um, um, and, and, um, and one of the things we learned in that couple of weeks is that it is, uh, and Robbie, who's here tonight, was doing it all the time here at the, uh, um, uh, one of the things, we learned is that it's some, um, there are worse things than having to get um, arrested. It's not pleasant. Um, I got to spend three days in central cell block in DC. It wasn't fun, but it wasn't the end of the world. What's the end of the world is the end of the world. And that's unfortunately what's coming at us rather quicker than we might want. Now, I'm, I've got less good excuse to be here to talk about fracking in a way than the rest of you. Because, um, you know, it's not going to happen in my backyard. Uh, uh, we in Vermont this spring managed to convince our state legislature and our governor that we actually did not want our state torn apart. And so they banned it. Um, and, And that's the first place it's going to happen, but it's not the last. That band of bands is going to start stretching down north, down south from Vermont and down through New York and someday into Pennsylvania and Ohio and all the other places that are facing this trouble. But even though they're not going to do anything to my state, um, this, at this point, isn't really about, I mean, it is about everybody's backyard and what's going to happen to their farm and their ranch and whatever, but what it's really about at this point is what is going to happen to this earth. Um, I spent the a afternoon on the phone with a friend of mine, Jason Box, who some of you may have met uh, in Ohio when he spoke at the great fracking actions that we did in Ohio, what, Josh, a month ago or so, and there were thousand people crowded under the dome of the Ohio Capitol. And, and Jason, who's a, a professor at Ohio State, came and talked there, which was brave of him, because he doesn't have tenure yet. But he's the greatest glaciologist in Greenland. He's the American scientist who spent the most time in Greenland. And so we were talking, I was interviewing him today to find out about what has been going on there. And just the you saw a couple of little stories in the paper about how they had a kind of unprecedented record melt. Well, he was just describing the way that the ice sheet is just beginning to disintegrate almost before people's eyes, you know. Uh, uh, snow that's been there for thousands of years just melting and melting fast. Ice turned to the consistency of sherbet, you know, is what he said. Just um, um, amazingly hard to hear as hard to hear as the stories that are coming from the middle of the country right now, from Iowa and Nebraska, from uh, you know, Missouri and, and, and Illinois, and places where the most fertile ground on the planet can't grow any food this year, where people are plowing under their corn um, because you can't grow corn if it's 95 or 100 degrees every day. It will not pollinate. You can't grow it if you have drought, like the drought we're having, or the drought they're having in Southern Europe, uh, which is driving down 
uh, uh, grain yields there, or the drought they're having in India, where they said today that it's looking like this monsoon may be the weakest monsoon in 40 plus years. Um, um, price of grain has gone up 40% in the last two months, okay? Now for us, we'll make it through that. You go to the store and buy a box of cornflakes, you pay more for the cardboard than you do for the corn, you know? Um, we'll survive even if the price goes up some. But if you get up in the morning and you have to go to the market and you have to buy cornmeal to make your family tortillas, 40% increase in the price of corn is no laughing matter. There's a lot of people on earth eating um, a lot less than they want to tonight because they can't afford it. And most of them have done absolutely nothing to cause the problem that they find themselves in. And so, you know, when we're here today, we're here for places in Pennsylvania and places in Ohio and places in New York, but we're also here for places all over the earth. And, and the good thing I can tell you from our work at 350 is just that those people stand in exactly the same solidarity with you. Um, and all over the world tonight, there are meetings going on like this one as people try to figure out how we're going to stop this rogue industry that seems intent on altering the planet's atmosphere past the point where we'll be able to carry on the civilizations that we were given. And it is the biggest fight and the hardest fight that anybody's ever had to do, and I am just so grateful to be doing it with all of you, and we'll just look forward. Um, not knowing if we're gonna win or not, um, though I think these fights about fracking we're gonna win. Not knowing for sure if we're gonna win, but knowing that we're gonna fight and do it side by side. Thank you all. Hey, organizers out there, are we going to win? Yeah. Hell yeah, we're going to win. So I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Winona Howder with Food and Water Watch. So. You know, I, we're talking about a lot of really distressing things, and Bill is right. This is a global movement, and I think it's important to celebrate some of the things that our global movement is achieving. So let's just talk about a few of them. Here in the U.S., we've passed more than 200 measures uh, against fracking, everywhere from a ban to uh, some kind of regulation. This is the kind of thing we need to do in communities around the country. Activists in Bulgaria and France stopped fracking. We pushed for moratoriums in multiple regions in Europe, and they're being successful in places like Germany and Ireland. Obtained moratorium on fracking in a, a very sensitive area of South Africa. Our movement has defeated state legislation that would expand fracking. And we prevented plans to open the Delaware River Basin to fracking so far. <laughs> and all around the country, activists are successfully stopping pipelines to export fracked gas. So we're having success, we just have to keep working harder. Our next speaker is working harder in Pennsylvania. We all know that Pennsylvania has become a sacrifice zone to fracking, and we need to do everything that we can to support our brothers and sisters in Pennsylvania. Jenny Lisek is an uh, organic farmer, and she's experienced firsthand the impacts of fracking. Please give a hand to Jenny. I'm going to read this. <laughs> so I want to try to give you a glimpse of some of the things that are going on in my community since the strangers and the white pickup trucks arrived. Everything I'm going to relate has happened within 25 miles from my home and organic farm in Jefferson County, Pennsylvania, which is near the Clearfield County line and sandwiched in between two of the dirtiest power plants 
in the United States. Uh, we've seen our Michigan State Forest transform. A forest that was once almost seamless wilderness is now turning into areas of woodlots separated by gas pads, pipelines, and compressor stations. There has been water contamination, two worker deaths, and a blowout. And radioactive drill cuttings are being trucked to a nearby landfill. 12,000 Marcellus wells will be drilled in Pennsylvania State Forest. Down the mountain from this extensive drilling, we have Dubois, a town whose drinking water has been contaminated with trihalomethanes since the drilling commenced. To the horror of the residents, an injection well is planned for their neighborhood. The residents on the other side of town are being driven mad because of the 24-7 water truck traffic idling in diesel fumes. And the town sells its water to Enron Oil and Gas for their non-stop activity in the Shannon State Forest. Nearby is Brockway, Senator Scarnati's hometown. The Senator's neighbors are in fear of Marcellus development happening now in their watershed. When they drilled the first well, it cut off the aquifer to one of their three reservoirs. And the developer has been cited for numerous violations. The Water Authority has spent thousands of dollars on legal counsel trying to protect their water. And as of May, Brockway Area Sewage Authority is not willing to say that they're no longer accepting oil and gas wastewater. There are two injection wells within 25 miles of me. The Irwin well, which is only four miles from my home, was operated at pressure exceeding its permitted maximum for three months, and the injection of brine continued during a five-month period of failed mechanical integrity. The operator was fined $160,000 the max, but there was no error or accident, just a blatant disregard of the rules. Uh, funny thing, the water that seeps out of the hill in which the injection well sits has unusually elevated TDS, salinity, and conductivity. When this was brought to the attention of EPA, they said it appeared to them to be acid mine drainage, and the report claimed there was no documented case of water contamination. Yet, there are no monitoring wells within or outside the one quarter mile review area. And interestingly, a local water expert is quite confident that it's not acid mine drainage. Still, acid mine drainage has long been a problem in my region. There are vast areas mapped and unmapped of underground mines and extensive surface mining. Some local streams still run red, which is a striking visual reminder. An expert in acid mine drainage testifies, in coal mining areas, aquifers are highly corrosive due to acid mine drainage despite a neutral pH. There is danger of premature failure due to the dissolution of cement casing and steel pipe after only a few years. Yet they cited an injection well in an area of supposedly acid mine drainage. A result of Marcellus activity that is seldom realized is a serious threat to the archaeological heritage of Pennsylvania. In my area alone, a 13th century village has been destroyed along with three Paleolithic sites. Nearby, a home exploded due to methane migration from drilling. Tragically, a young child, Bailey, and his grandparents were killed. Local police report an increase in criminal activity. Our country roads are no longer safe for the usual bikes and farm equipment or Amish buggies, and there have been accidents. A child's nearest pond is now likely to be a half million gallon toxic waste pit. And wafting in on the country breeze is carcinogenic benzene and toluene. And can you be assured that when the fire trucks come to put out a house or farm fire, they might not be adding water fuel to the flames? My township contracted with a gas company to spend brine on our dirt roads for dust suppression. There is such a dusty road that borders our farm. Our two dogs, Finnegan and Fiona, had to check out the fresh spring, as dogs will. I found it unusual that immediately afterwards they both spent an inordinate amount of time licking off their paws. Others in the township had become suspicious. Age-old trees were suddenly dying. Eventually, the company was fined for spreading frack brine on our roads. The Gilly Party claimed they didn't know how the frack got in their tanks. Whatever they say, there seem to be elevated Geiger readings now near this road, and to our great sorrow, Finnegan died of lymphoma in the prime of his life, and Fiona gave birth to seven stillborn puppies. And was it the frack brine that he licked off their paws that harmed the dogs? 
or was it water from our spring that had been impacted after Marcellus well had been drilled on a neighboring farm? A well, by the way, that has violations for improper storage and disposal of drilling waste. Will one of my family come down with cancer someday from chemicals that may have been in the impacted water? I've spent far too many days crying, scared, and fretting when I first saw stakes on my neighbor's property and found that the fluorescent flagging signaled 10 and a half acres of Marcellus development that was way too close and upwind. Now a mother overcome with panic and fright, my nights were sleepless or filled with nightmares. Calls and emails to every agency, environmental group, and government office resulted with the same response. There's nothing you can do. Would we be refugees from our own home? After an arduous and stressful appeal, the permit was withdrawn. But the whole process did not leave us unscathed. It was a rude awakening to the reality of just who it seems our bureaucracy is working for. As you know, we're put in harm's way, and it's all perfectly legal. You have to spend hours waiting for your water tank to fill up at a neighbor's that you hope has water better than yours. Tough luck. And this, well, this is just a small part of my neck of the woods. Um, as you all know, it's a story that's being repeated all over the shale region. We listen to our neighbors and friends and families, and we hear of water woes, failing health, explosions, spills, leaks, illegal dumping, blowouts, fires, dreams dashed, the fears, the shared shock that this can actually be happening and that no one is listening. We testify, rally, sign petitions, more petitions, submit comments, write letters, share information, and even speak, however uncomfortably, to large crowds. <laughs> near gas production has no question as to which Cornell expert's methane emissions estimate is more accurate. We see them venting purposely and accidentally. We hear the hissing, see the bubbles. We know of the leaking pipelines. We smell them are captain. We've heard of the old abandoned well pipes that can still be lit. Dig into your thirst, thesaurus. There are not enough words to describe the absurdity of doing nothing when we know our climate is in crisis and our most precious and most valuable resources are being compromised. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger does not apply here. I know I'm speaking to the choir, but I'm in a church. I strongly urge you to consider what your actions may bring your children or grandchildren, perhaps more aptly, consider what your inaction will bring upon us. Jenny's story is why we're all here this weekend and why we're going to fight and make our government do what's right. There are several seats up here. Would people please come from the back? There are at least seven seats. There are also some steps to sit on. Please come make yourselves comfortable. So when we look at why this is happening, it's all about public policy for sale. Over the last five election cycles, the oil and gas industry gave federal candidates for office $240 million. And in just the last five years, they've lobbied to the tune of two-thirds of a billion dollars. That's why we have this propaganda war that we're fighting. And it's why a number of groups are getting together this fall on September 22nd to do a global frack down. And we'd invite you all to be part of the global frack down, um, doing an event in your community. Uh, there's a website, uh, it's not just one group, it's many, many groups, globalfrackdown.org. Let's let our public policy makers know that their votes shouldn't be for sale. Our next... Our next speaker is Frida Jacques. <laughs> um, she's been a leader in the Onondaga Nation community for more than 30 years. 
Her people are the original inhabitants uh, of central New York, one of the places that the industry wants to frack. And more than a thousand years ago, her forefathers and foremothers were part of a confederacy that established the first democracy. Her nation was one of the first institutions to tell the government of New York, no fracking, no way. Frida? So to us, it's, it's at Onondaga, it's, there's no question about fracking. Since it threatens water in any way, it's wrong. Water is one of the basics of life. All living things need it. You know, even a dog will not do his thing where he sleeps. Right? So why are we taking water, which for thousands of years has remained the same fresh water coming and going, coming and going. You learn this in fifth grade. But this process takes thousands of gallons, puts all those chemicals in it, and takes it out of that cycle. We are so lucky to be in this northeast area. I'm from up near central New York, at Onondaga. There is a quarter of the fresh water on earth in our area. Are we crazy to mess with that? There are whole countries who hardly have any water. People have to walk miles to get their water and carry it home. Now one of the things I thought of to speak to you about today was what's next. And not in the sense of organizing, but in the sense of what is really behind all this. And part of it is the value we, have, we carry about life and the basics of life. Now, we at Onondaga and the Haudenosaunee people have a tradition that we carry out in all our gatherings like this. It's called the gonna hand you, the words before all else. And what it is is a thanksgiving. It's a, we're reaching out to those parts of creation, talking to them and thanking them for doing their duty. Mother Earth, who's holding us and providing for us, as she always has. The waters that run along on her from the little streams, the fresh water stream, streams to the creeks and the rivers and the oceans. We need all that water and we're thankful to them. And in this Thanksgiving address, we thank them for following their duties and we send them respect and love. And we look around, we know that the trees are still growing. They're still there, available. They have medicine in them. They have food in them. They have, you know, you have fruit in them. And they have great beauty. And we use them for many things. So we thank all the tree life that they continue on in their duties. We thank all the berries that come out each year. We thank the medicines that grow and are available to us in the woods. We send our thanksgiving love and respect to them. And the whole crowd agrees with each one mentioned. We thank the winds for coming, clearing the air so we could breathe clean air. We thank the bird life that comes and they sing their songs. In the morning at 4.30, you'll hear their songs. And they lift our hearts. So we send them thanksgiving. And when we see the geese going north, we know it's going to be cooler. But you know, we all know too that the weather is changing. And we thank our grandmother Moon for coming up in the nighttime and sending her light so we might see one another. 
We also know Grandmother Moon guides all the females, so there might be new life. So we want to send her a Thanksgiving love and respect. And our elder brother, the sun, is out doing his thing, sending energy to our gardens, sending energy down here so we might see one another in the daytime. We want to thank the stars in the sky, for they have their duties. So this kind of thanksgiving is done throughout our culture, and we're very fortunate. But somehow, you know, it's just obvious. You don't mess with water. You don't spoil it. You don't do anything that will cause harm to it because it will affect every living being. And I mean the squirrels and the raccoons and the deer and all those things living out there. They have a right to live. They have their duties, the four-legged. <clears throat> so I wanted to share this value of life. And, and I thank you all for working so hard and for doing your job here and talking and working and marching and helping people understand because we all will be affected. All the living things as time goes by. And I'm sorry there's been so much damage. Hey, there's got to be jobs in those that cleaning up the damage, don't you think? <laughs> So I want to thank you all for coming to D.C. and willing to march. And yes, let's, let's ban fracking. that everybody needs to call Governor Como and tell him that they can't frack another nation's land. So speaking of nature, Josh Fox is a force of nature. In fact, last night, I saw Josh perform a miracle. It was at a fundraiser for New Yorkers against fracking. It was after hours, hundreds of people were drinking wine and beer. It was a rowdy crowd. Josh Fox got up, silenced them, and got them to listen. I think we all know that Josh made gas land and that the oil and gas industry is after him and his newest uh, film, The Sky is Pink, which is focused on New York, uh, has made them so angry that they're spending millions of dollars to try to um, refute everything that he says. Josh. Thank you, Lenora. Um, this is like a reunion for me. Um, my experience of working on this problem, you know, is, is a road movie in my head that you all got to see. And so I'm really, I'm just hum humbled and, and so touched that, you know, I can look around the room and I see Doug and Bridget Shields and Dana Don Donnelly from Pittsburgh and I can see Dane Bradsky from Australia, right? And Calvin Tillman and Tim Ruggiero from Texas over here. And Gwen from Colorado, and Deb Thomas from Wyoming, and my mom down the center aisle. <laughs> Don't know where she's from. Mothers Against Fragging, Mothers for Sustainable Energy. Not, not, not Mother Frackers. And John Fenton, every director needs a, a movie star, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's to me a, this incredible road movie, and I could go on and keep talking, Iris from Philadelphia, Wes from the Catskills, you know, and there were 
um, some bike riders that are going to be hosting this after party, right, or something like that. Yeah. Tour de Frac. Yeah. They rode from Butler County, PA, down to D.C. on their bikes, Tour de Frac. I met them in Ohio, and, I, and the same week I, I met uh, some people, or they Facebooked me or something, who were doing a bike ride from the Gulf of Mexico to Halliburton headquarters in Houston. And I forgot the name of that ride, but I connected the two of them, and I thought, you know, this is a lot like my experience. To, to go around the United States of America and go from frack zone, and then you're out of it for two hours, then you hit another frack zone the next state, and you're out of it for another hour, and then you hit another one for six hours, and you drive down through the western slope of Colorado, and then you're out of it for a little while, and then you hit the northern western tip of New Mexico, and you're in it for a while, and then you get across, and you hit Texas, and it just keeps going like that. And I was thinking about what I was going to say tomorrow, and I just had this horrible, um, horrible, disgusting story from Stephen King that came to my mind. And I, are there members from the press here? Were they invited? Yes. I don't know where they are. Okay, but these, what are these people here? You guys are the press, right? The last time I was in DC, I got arrested for being the only press in a, in a, in a hearing. You know, you guys are the press, right? Anyway, I wanted the mainstream to think about Stephen King, so there's a story about a guy who gets, it's a crazy story, it's, a, it's called Survivor Tale or something, he gets marooned on a desert island. He's a doctor and he's a morphine addict. And he's washed up on this, from a, he's like the drug dealer's doctor or something, and they're all dead. And he's on this desert island, there's no food, and he's sitting there like trying to figure out what to eat, and he keeps injecting himself with more and more morphine. And then finally, he gets so hungry that he cuts off his foot and he eats it. This is a Stephen King story. <laughs> and then, he, then he, he, he's kind of getting further into this sort of weird drug addled and on his own foot, crazy, and he cuts off the next part of his leg, you know. And then he goes to the other foot and the other part and he gets all the way up. And the story ends, you know, with him tying off the arteries in his leg, trying to get a little bit more of himself to eat. And I just, to me, it's the apt metaphor for what we're doing here in the United States of America. We're not, we're not sacrificing pockets. We are going from place to place. Because when I thought about these bike rides, I thought, well, next summer we should get a bike ride going from every state to each one of these places and point out that we're, America's not a thing to be eaten, you know. America, after doing this for, you know, you travel around enough, and Bill knows, America is your body. You know, this accent that you hear from, from John here, and then this one from Robert Finney over there, from Arkansas, you know, from Pittsburgh. And this is parts of your being that you start cutting off. And when I asked Lon Burnham, representative, state representative from, from Fort Worth, he said, there's really absolutely nothing new about this. We've been doing extractive uh, uh, energy at the expense of indigenous populations for the entire history of this country. The thing that's kind of unique about this is now there's a lot of white upper middle class people who are being treated the same way third world people have always been treated. That's the direct quote. It'll be in Gasland too. <laughs> and, and then he starts talking about Avatar. And I really want to keep it, but I think we have to cut it. Because <laughs> Gasland Avatar is the same movie, basically. We are the blue people, if you haven't figured that part of it out. But I'm bringing it up because we are, we're eating ourselves. And there are people in the buildings not far from here who are taking the money to make sure that we're living in hell, and that we're living in fear. The gas industry has come out with article after article this week that says I'm fear-mongering. <laughs> well, I'm afraid. <laughs> the honest truth, right? It's scary as hell to be staring down what Jenny is talking about every day. All over this nation, people are not alone, 
And guess what? The press isn't here. So you have to do that job. I have to do that job. You have to jump up and say, I'm going to be the press for the 25 people that I know. Or maybe make a YouTube video and hope it gets into Sundance or something like that. You know? But this is the incredible experience that I've had. So I'm, I'm incredibly humbled to be here to talk about it. But as Bill says in the new article, there is an enemy. And we have to make sure that we start to know their names. The people who run Chesapeake, and Exxon Mobil, and Shell. The people who take their money to get elected so that they don't listen to you. There's a great website. Is Steve in the house? Kreutzmann? DirtyEnergyMoney.com. You can look up your representative and find out how much money they took. Because when we made the video, the image for that video was of a horizontal wellbore going down into the earth, snaking underneath the capital, and injecting money into the chamber to blow the top off of the capital. Because that is what is happening. We are being outsized. We are being outsized. We are being outspent. And this amazing thing, which I experience and know of America, which is in every piece of me. That is what we're supposed to be building here, and representing here, my, my body, my foot, my leg, my arm, my hands, my fingertips, my eyes. Not ExxonMobil and Halliburton and Shell and the chemicals that they would inject to me to make it impossible for me to continue to live in this country. All right, thanks. Thank you, Josh. So the Stop the Frack Attack is building the national movement. Let's celebrate the national movement. We don't have time to go around and hear everybody's name, but let's see where people are from. Stand up when I call your state. Let's celebrate how many places people have come from. I know there are people from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania.
is Jason Bell, Bell, who is one of three Butler County residents in Pennsylvania who put together the Tour de Flock race. <laughs> And that stands for the Freedom Ride for Awareness and Community Knowledge. It was a 400 mile, 14 day bike ride. That began on July 14th and had all sorts of events on the way to DC. Jason, tell us about your Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm going to take this down. Um, first, anybody who rode with us, would you please stand up? I want to recognize those of you who rode with us on the way. We rode with a wonderful group of people. Uh, whether it was Pittsburgh, where we had 60 people come out and join us for a community ride that went from the North Shore of Pittsburgh over to the South Side, where we were met with a street band, or whether it was in Frostburg, Maryland, where we were met by Save Western Maryland, and we rode 14 miles in the torrential rain down into Cumberland. Great event. Thank you, Matia. <laughs> but as was mentioned, we started in Butler County, the center of Butler County, Butler the city, right in front of Representative Mike Kelly's office. He's a Pennsylvania representative that we got to visit yesterday on Capitol Hill. And I saw quite a few of you standing up from Pennsylvania. How many of you knew that Butler was named the seventh best small town in America by Smithsonian Magazine just a few months ago? Did you hear that? Yeah. And that is in large part due to the county that surrounds it. Butler County's primary source of income is tourism, followed quickly by agriculture. These two industries have been put in direct competition with toxic fracking. We're being told that these will bring new jobs to our communities when in fact they're squashing traditional industry and pushing them out because of land use and because of air and water contamination. One of the things that we did while we traveled is we brought with us a storybook called Stories from the Shale Fields. And we collected personal accounts, first person accounts from Butler County across Pennsylvania and across the United States. In this book reveals some of the real economic truth as to what happens to families who lease and some who do not lease who live next to these drilling operations. We're seeing 85% drop in property values to some homes. Some people estimate that their business, their farm, is losing $10,000 a year because of lost hay fields, dead cows, and because they have to pay to have water shipped in to feed, to water their, um, to water their crops. It was, to me, the travel a reminder of real economic development. The golden calf is jobs, jobs, jobs. That's what we've been held up in front of us for years, that this oil and gas industry will bring us. But really, they're extracting jobs. They're taking money out of our communities and they're consolidating it in the pockets of few. And we're seeing our local economies be steamrolled and the health of our citizens be turned inside out and our environment be put in a blender and shredded. So. Many people asked me when I first started to talk about this, why in the world would you hop on a bicycle and travel 400 miles to Washington, D.C to try to tell personal stories about individuals who have been affected. And it's because I felt powerless. In my own community, I was watching people trying to live their daily lives without potable drinking water. 
we've had to organize with local churches to deliver 20 to 25 gallons of water to families a week. And we do that every Monday or Sunday where we load up the truck quite literally and take volunteers and go home to home and drop water off. Now, Iris has done a wonderful job through protecting our waters at raising money. Not only has she called attention to the stories that take place in Conoquinessing Township, which is just three miles from my home, but she is continuing to raise money for those individuals who have been affected. So if you can visit protectingourwaters.com, there is a way to make donations up there, and that money, 100% of it goes to water. None of it goes to the maintaining of the website or any other product or project that she's working on. <laughs> But all of that was hard to say. When people asked, why are you doing this bike ride? There wasn't an easy way to say it. That was until a month ago. A month ago, Rex Tillerson, do you guys know who Rex Tillerson is? Yeah, the CEO of ExxonMobil? Okay. He was speaking to the Council on Foreign Affairs. And he said the following when he was talking about toxic fracking. He said, while the price of a misstep can be a problem to the people surrounding a well, in the big picture, it's pretty small. I'm so I'm sorry, Mr. Tillerson, but that well going into my, next to my daughter's preschool is not pretty small. I'm sorry, Mr. Tillerson, but the health impacts that are plaguing the community next to mine are not pretty small. I'm sorry, Mr. Tillerson, but the fact that people in my neighborhood are going bankrupt because they have to sell their homes for 85% of what they're worth because what mother in her right mind would continue to live in a home where she's forced to bathe her child in a bathtub with water that's been proven to contain arsenic? That is not small. That's their whole world. That's my whole world. So tomorrow, when we unite on the mall, those of us here and everybody else who will join us, I want you to remember one thing. We are not small, we are large, and we are powerful. Thank you. questions from all of you. So the first question is, um, it's two parts. How do we make clear that it's not a choice between gas and oil, but a choice between gas and something better? And the second part is that investing our limited funds as a country and changing our energy infrastructure to another dirty fossil fuel is a bad investment. Who would like to take a crack at that? <laughs> Go ahead. Nope. We'll just pass this. The, um, look, I, I took my best shot at it in a sense in this piece in uh, Rolling Stone last week. And, and, uh, the point of the piece was that we've 
basically used up all the space we have to put carbon in the atmosphere no matter where it comes from, uh, coal or gas or oil or anything. Um, um, we've got only the slightest bit of room left at all. You I mean, we're already got too much in there. Um, but e even by the most conservative estimates, we can put 500 and some more gigatons of carbon in. These guys already have, the fossil fuel industry, 2,800 gigatons worth of carbon in their reserves. The fact that they're out looking for more when we already have five times more than we can burn, that's a kind of working definition of insane. And, and so it's way past time to stop talking about bridge fuels to whatever. Um, we got to forget about the bridges and we got to make the leap and go to the things that we know we need, sun and wind, in order to power our lives. And it is entirely possible to do it. The most hopeful statistic in the last six months that I know of was that one day last month, the country of Germany managed to generate more than half the power it used from solar panels within its borders. Okay. Now, <laughs> Germany, Germany is, you know, it's a, it's a northern, Munich is north of Montreal, you know. Um, if they can figure out how to power, the point is, we're not, we're, we're not short of technology. What we're short of is political will, and what we're long on is greed. And we've got to turn those two around, and we can. But it's going to require all of us organizing, not only around the places that we live and the things that are affecting us, but understanding that we have, uh, uh, that if we're going to, those things are going to work. And if we're going to live up to our ethical duties as well, then we have to keep reminding ourselves that we're citizens not only of those states where we came from, but of the whole damn planet. Um, because we're at the moment where it's theoretically, in fact, entirely possible to save Vermont uh, uh, while the planet goes to hell, and that's not a useful bargain in the, in the long run, okay? So th that's the best shot I got. Just to add a tiny bit to that, um, the amazing thing about this problem is that it has a solution. You know, if it didn't have a solution, there would be no problem. You know that adage. But just to give you a tip to get started, if you want to know how possible it is to run the planet on renewable energy, just um, Google Mark Jacobson, Scientific American. It's a front, front page article, Scientific American, I think two years ago. Three years ago, it's even th it's three years old. And he lays out how you can actually balance uh, energy generation from the sun and the wind, because the wind blows harder at night and the sun shines obviously more during the day. And you can get there um, to something like 98% of all the power that we use on uh, using renewable energy. Or read Lester Brown, uh, Plan B 4.0. And um, when I interviewed Lester Brown, he said there's more wind energy in just North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas to run everything we run in the United States, including our fleet of cars. So it's thoroughly doable. What's in the way is the fossil fuel industry that is constantly getting into the halls of our government before we can. <laughs> there, <laughs> Alec Baldwin, in Syracuse said that they're doing push-ups in the basement at four in the morning, you know, while you're sleeping. <laughs> but the point is that, that we have that power and we have to take back our power of democracy so that we can take back the other kind of power that has existed since Jimmy Carter put the solar panels on the White House, you know. Those solar panels, after Ronald Reagan took them down, are now in a museum in China in a town that only makes solar panels. Okay, the second question. How are mountaintop removal, fracking, deep sea drilling, tar sands, enhanced oil recovery related, and how can resistances to these forms of extraction be linked? They're all in my new movie about Bill. <laughs> <laughs> this weekend alone, we have the Stop the Frack Attack, 
We have the Ramps Action Camp and the Tarzan's Blockade meeting all happening at the same time. Any thoughts? It just shows this desperate clawing that we have to get every last piece of carbon-based fuel out of the earth that we possibly can. The days of easy energy in that sector are over. So we're willing to contaminate and pollute billions of gallons of water a day and exchange that for our energy needs in a time when we're experiencing unprecedented droughts across the world. I don't know what the solution is and how to get all the different groups who are working on these different organizations or these different effects together. But I know, for example, when we toured down, we stopped at a Ramps campaign event called Stop the Kaboom in West Virginia as an attempt to form some allies, some relationships across those borders. Because really, mountaintop removal and fracking, it's the same evil with a different name. And, and, you know, this, there's a real, I, I repeat last week, well, piece last week just saying there's a kind of summer of resistance underway, and it's, you know, uh, in, we'll be in New England on Sunday uh, uh, trying to fight this next tar sands pipeline that want to run through New England. We'll be out west a couple of weeks after that trying to stop the building coal ports uh, on the Pacific coast. But it's got to be said, we're never going to deal with the fossil fuel industry in the end, one pipeline at a time, or one frack well at a time, or anything else. Sooner or later, what we're gonna have to do is end the greatest special break that any industry ever got. These are the only guys who ever were who were allowed to pour their waste into the atmosphere for free, okay? No other business gets to put its tree. If you run a restaurant on the corner here, you cannot just put your garbage in the street at the end of the night. It'd be cheaper to do that, you'd make more money, but you're not allowed to do it because that's what civilization is, you know? You clean up uh, uh, your mess, unless you're Exxon, unless you're Chesapeake, unless you're these guys, then you get to pour it out for free. And so that's why, I mean, Naomi Klein and I just sent a letter yesterday saying, day after the election, we're launching a road show across this country, and then around the world, uh, that's gonna focus on taking the fossil fuel system, the industry, trying to take it down once and for all. And, and, and Josh, Josh has already uh, promised to make the, he's going to come along and he's promised to make the movie as we do it. And, you know, uh, this is dinosaur industry in more ways than one, the fossil fuel industry. And, and you know, at this point, it's we got to either do it all or it's, you know, almost not worth doing because that's what's taking the world apart and in rapid, rapid order. I, I think it's so surreal and I, I think about it a lot and I think, well, maybe they know something we don't know. Like maybe there's going to be a massive meteorite that's going to take the earth out so they think we can use all... <laughs> We just can use everything. I mean, I don't understand like where our leadership is, why they think it's all right for this generation to use up all the available resources on Earth as if there is no future. It, it, it boggles my mind. We think the rapture is coming any day. Yeah, we're going to take comments from the floor in just a moment. I just want to um, add that several of you mentioned uh, our elected officials, and it's really about building political power. And I just want to mention the events again that I referred to in the beginning because we have a lot of people who've come in. There's going to be a summer and fall of action. And what we have to do is tie these issues to elections and start getting rid of these bastards who aren't doing the public interest. events that are coming up. Uh, there's going to be uh, a weekend of action in New York City and Albany the weekend of August 
uh, 25th and 26th. 27th, 26th and 27th. Um, maybe even all three days. Maybe all three days. Uh, stay tuned for more about that. And I'm, the next day too. And the next day too. And that I mentioned earlier the shale gas outrage and why we all need to be in Philadelphia on September 20th. And Iris is here to answer more questions about that. And then there's the Global Frack Down, and that site, if you want to do a local event, is globalfrackdown.org. Okay, I think we're ready to start taking questions or comments from the floor. And what we're going to do, because there's just one mic, is we're going to ask people who want to uh, speak for a minute or less, if you can just kind of line up here. And uh, Robbie has the, uh, uh, is going to have the mic. My name is Lia from Maryland. Uh, I think I'm not small and we are not small. And we are powerful, and that is true. And then the other uh, our opponents, our, our enemy, they are really evil. And it's not just fucking industry, it's not just oil and gas, but really there's the evil who are destroying our society in all directions. They are destroying our democracy, they are destroying our really free market because there's no free market. So they are a profit over people. So I just wonder if you think there's no media here because the evil are there, they control them because they hire them. So they use money to buy their employee or to threaten their life. So I just wonder if we can coordinate this with uh, maybe some free press, maybe HEOU, to really say we got the right rather than being threatened. to say to, to Josh and to Bill that I think you may be deceiving people when you say that we can run all of this industrial civilization on solar and wind. Uh, it might not be possible. And we have to ask ourselves also, what, is, what are we using all this energy for? We're pay, we're paving over the earth. The Onondaga, you said that civilization is about cleaning up waste. Uh, you could ask the Onondaga, they'll tell you, no, that's not what civilization has done. Civilization is pretty much trashed. Uh, lots of this earth long before fossil fuels, by cutting down all the forests, by leveling everything. And I think that you deceive people when you say that we can just switch to some other energy source and it'll all be fine. We obviously need to fundamentally change our way of life. Yeah, what else? Hi. Um, I got a frantic phone call from a friend last night down in Steubenville. And she said there was a train that came through there hauling um, crystalline silica sand. It was going down a conveyor belt and was going onto the trucks. Some of it was spilling on the ground. So the oil and gas industry, being the good neighbors that they are, offered to give it to some of the neighbors. So their children could put it in their sandboxes. And they're telling them it's safe to put in their gardens. Silica sand uh, will kill you. Yeah. It uh, causes ciliosis. Um, it's, it's what they make glass out of. It will cut your lungs wide open. It will go into every mucous membrane it can enter. And um, if you have pre-existing conditions, um, you're, you're even more trouble. So <clears throat> I don't know about any of the other ladies in this audience tonight, but I'll tell you this much. You know what they say about a woman scorned? Well, now you've pissed off a mother. Um, I'm glad the lady talked about um, silica sand. The, the uh, part of the industry that you guys forgot 
and that is always forgotten, is frac sand mining, which I know, Josh, you are out interviewing people in Wisconsin. I'm a journalist. I just wrote an article about frac sand mining. Without the frac sand, which is silica sand, it's a very particular kind of sand that comes from the uh, 500 million sandstone hills in um, Wisconsin and Minnesota, in part in Iowa, and they are mountaintop removing, they are removing, the industry is removing these legendary hills which cannot be replaced, transforming the ecology of this part of the Midwest to frack other people's landscapes a mile and a half below the ground and poison the children and the people there. So I am um, just reaching out to you guys and reminding you that there are beleaguered people out there who are crying out to have solidarity with the movement the movement here, and particularly in New York State where the movement has successfully staved off the richest and the most powerful industry in the history of humankind. So that is not to be forgotten. That is a really amazing And Josh is, you know, you, you guys have been working on that, but that can't be forgotten. So do you have any plans to reach out to these folks? We'd love to take the names. At foodandwaterwatch.org, you can get a fact sheet on silica sand for folks who are interested. Um, shall we take some responses? I can remind people, um, there was the question about the media, um, how much energy we are using, and then the silica. I'll, I'd like to start with the media, if I could. Um, the action that we undertook, the bicycle ride, was based purely on the idea that there's no way we could outspend the PR machine that's coming out of the oil and gas industry. But by using creative action, human power, and a little bit of um, social media and some savvy in that, that we could call attention to our cause and start browbeating people with personal stories that you cannot turn away and, and ignore. And of course, one of the things that we traveled with the entire time down on the back of the trailer or the bike was six gallons of this. The, this is tap water from a home a quarter mile from a drilling site that the family live, has lived there for 10 years. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have lived there for 10 years if my water looked like this. This is a recent change in their community, and it's not just in their home, but it's in several other homes. So you really need to get your message out there. You have to go to them. You have to force them to listen. And in many ways, the local newspapers are going to be your biggest allies. It's not going to be the city papers. It's not going to be the, the large media coming out of D.C. or coming out of New York because they're going to look at you like they've got bigger stories to cover. But if you can do creative actions within your own smaller communities and start to form those relationships with particular reporters, if you see an article that you like written by a reporter, the next time you have an action, contact that reporter. You know, don't go to the press, the general press desk. Go directly after that reporter because they have obviously have an interest in what's going on. I, I, uh, that's, let me say first, as a journalist by training, that's good advice, and um, you really can get people to cover things, especially locally, and the good news about the moment in which we live is we're a lot less dependent on the media, in a sense, than we were even a few years ago. We're quite capable of creating our own. When we, everybody was getting here getting arrested last year about the Keystone thing, Nobody reported on it for a week, for 10 days, and we built with people on websites and everything around the country a huge storm, and, and that can at least do some of what needs doing. I want to talk for just a minute, because I, I think me and Josh maybe both were accused of deceiving people. Um, 
uh, and into thinking that somehow we would just be running the exact same society or whatever that we have now on the sun and the wind. My, uh, you know, my real work in the world is not as a uh, organizer. This is something I sort of fell into. My real work in the world is as a writer, and I've spent um, a lot of time writing about these kind of issues. Um, I wrote a book a few years ago called Deep Economy um, that was an important book, at least for me. And it was entirely about the fact that we need very badly to change the ways in uh, which we live, and that the way we will do that above all else is the day that we, uh, on a mass scale anyway, attach a price uh, to fossil fuel high enough to make us reevaluate what it is that's important and how we live. If we're going to get done what needs doing uh, in the time that we have, um, that's how we're going to do it. And the day that we do is the day that local agriculture becomes not the exception but the rule because you can't run industrial agriculture on, uh, on, uh, without cheap fossil fuel. And it's the day that we stop sprawling out forever around and begin consolidating in. And it's the day that we stop building 2,500 square foot houses and start, it's the, uh, we saw the day in the summer of uh, 2008 when gasoline went over $4 a gallon was precisely the day that people all across America figured out they did not need, you know, semi-military vehicles to go to the grocery store. Um, and so we got a lot of work to do. But I want to just add one thing. Um, without, maybe it's, maybe it's just the heat, but I think not. I think it's important in movements um, um, to try and be a little more um, in solidarity with each other than the tone of that um, question. And it may just be, it may only be because, I mean, I, I actually am going to leave in a second because my daughter's in the hospital today and I should be home in Vermont and I stayed here because I didn't want to miss this or miss what's coming tomorrow because it's important. But you know, the, um, uh, an awfully important part of the work that we need to do has to do with generousness and the biggest change that we need in this society has less to do with our material consumption than with the fact that we have allowed ourselves to become a kind of hyper-individualist sort of people. Um, 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 incredibly concerned with our own selves or sometimes with our own self-righteousness. And the ability to build communities, uh, communities that can work together, is the absolute key the most important thing that we could be doing if we were going to solve the problems in which we find. And the thing, the thing I got to say about fracking, the thing I got to say about fracking above all that depresses me about it, and the thing that made me want so much to keep it out of Vermont, um, is it's not its effect on water or air or anything else, it's its effect on communities. And to watch communities get divided constantly between people who have some land to frack or don't or have some, I mean, that's, that's the kind of sad thing that should not be forced on communities. We should be doing everything we can to strengthen communities, and that's an awfully important part of the work that you all are about. Um, 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 we talk about it in terms of the water and the air and things, but the human community and its uh, that's just as important in the long run. Um, so I, I am going to duck out and go make a phone call um, back home and see what's going on. But I will see you all tomorrow. What time are we gathering? One o'clock on uh, the West Lawn. Um, bring your bring your sunscreen and because uh, uh, I, I got to say I, I I ended up I started off writing about the ozone layer a long time ago, so I take sunscreen very seriously. So make sure you have some, and uh, uh, we will. Um, I'll see you there tomorrow. So. I just I want to say a personal thanks to Bill McKibben for his leadership. We would be nowhere without Bill McKibben. Thanks, Bill.
Thanks, Bill. I hope your daughter is okay. Not that I could ever add to something like what Bill just said, um, but I'm wearing here a t-shirt from Peaceful Uprising. Yeah. I wear it a lot. I wear it in the sky is pink. Uh, Tim DeChristopher, this is an organization that he's a part of. Um, he's in jail right now, right? For, uh, he's in the second half of a two year term, I think he went in about a year ago. He blockaded an oil and gas auction in, uh, uh, Utah, some amazing public lands that belong to you and me. And he went in and he bid on the auction. And he bought like $14 million worth of parcels. Until they figured out that this guy was not from the oil and gas industry, that he was Tim DeChristopher, somebody at that point no one had heard of. And <laughs> um, then they couldn't dismantle the damage he'd done because the first half of the auction he just bid without winning stuff. So he couldn't figure out what they had like, what he had thrown off the price of. And so they had to just scuttle the whole thing. And he did it to call attention to the fact that it was an illegal auction to begin with, that they hadn't done a NEPA review. And that in fact, the oil and gas industry was stealing from the American people. These public lands are a great place to turn off your television and turn off your cell phone. Another great place to not have to answer your cell phone is in jail. As I was like a real vacation, you know, when last time I was here with Bill when they took us away in the paddy wagon and it's like, oh, I don't have to answer my phone, I'm handcuffed. I'm saving energy. I just, it's an upside, right? I thought they're hauling me out of this hearing. I don't have to tape another goddamn hearing. This is not using the battery on the camera. These are ways to conserve energy um, that are not so thoroughly deceiving. But um, just scientifically speaking, we can do it. We can, we can run the world out of renewable energy. We know that. But what I wanted to tell you something, I told you this whole story about Tim because it's something he told me when I interviewed him last June in, on one of the parcels that he had saved, one of these most amazing places. And he said, you know, um, we have used oil and gas to create every possible thing that we could ever desire or want. And we have, tr we have figured out ways of creating energy to create every possible piece of thing that we could have. I'm paraphrasing, obviously he said this better than I am. But we've never figured out a source of fuel that would make us happy, that would solve our human and spiritual needs, right? And I was like, whoa, Tim. You know, and he's here's about the man about to go into jail. But the truth is that, that when we're talking about sustainability, of course we're talking about conservation. But what I really believe is gonna win this, and I believe we are going to win this, we simply have no choice, is culture. You saw Artists Against Fracking just get started, right? <laughs> Sean Lennon, Yoko Ono, Robert De Niro, Lady Gaga, whoever the hell else is in there. I mean, it's like a list of artists, like the best, most amazing people, like people, I, I thought the, the Flaming Lips have signed up against fracking. I mean, this is amazing, this is amazing, right? <laughs> Flaming Lips fans in the house. But what's, what we're gonna have to do here is you know, I went to this Chefs for the Marcellus last night and there was a three hour dance party at the end of it. Just went on, I couldn't go home. I tried to go home like six times. You know, we've got to build something here that's, a, that's fun to be a part of. We've got to build something here that creates great art and great culture and the thing that we owe Bill is that he's a great writer. You know, he's a great artist. We have to participate in creating that next wave of culture. Um, that does things, thinks things differently as well, that understands that the beauty of this country and of Australia and of Germany and France and Thailand and all, all these incredible places is our character and our inner possessions. You know what I mean? Not the other things that um, we use oil and gas to make.
And speaking of that addition to the culture and inside reflection and spirituality, uh, we have a wonderful singer-songwriter who's been on the Tour de Frac with us, Zach here in the back, who... who's done some great shows at some wonderful venues, and he's gonna be performing here this evening at nine o'clock, so make sure you stick around and become inspired. Okay, it's getting hot. We're going to close the questions at the end of the per last person. We'll get a 30 second response from each of our um, speakers, and then we're gonna to celebrate tomorrow. So I'm from a small contingent of three from Idaho. Um, we, we, we flew in on our brooms. <laughs> and I, I want to say thank you to everybody. We are going to go home thoroughly. Oh, there's one more. Four from Idaho. Um, we are going to go home. The, one of the women I came with is running for state senate office. Senator from uh, New South Wales in Australia, um, and, uh, and uh, I'm a representative of the Greens Party, and I'd just like to say that um, the words of Bill, the, um, the films of Josh, uh, and the actions of all of you have been an inspiration in Australia, um, and have meant that in New South Wales, which is one of the most pro-resource uh, extractive, dig it up, send it out uh, states in the world. We're the largest exporter of coal in the world. We've been able to fight gas to a standstill in that state because of what's happened here. So I just wanted to say that. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dana. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Home of the first band against fracking in the United States of America. And we have people sitting on this stage tonight to thank for that because of the inspiration that was provided. And I get emotional every time I say this because I stand in front of crowds all the time. And I tell people what this man right here said when I was sitting on my couch recovering from two years after a bout with cancer, watching his movie. And he looked in that camera and he said, by God, if your way of life is being threatened. And he went on with these eyes. I looked right into his eyes. Josh went right into those eyes. And I looked at those eyes. And you all know, you've all seen it, so I won't go through it because he said go fast. But he was telling the truth. I saw the truth in his eyes. And immediately, because of this amazing work that Josh did, I was changed forever. And everybody that knew me before knew I was no activist. I did all the good in the world I could possibly do. I am the accidental activist, really. But when I understood from you, I'm starstruck in a way because what's changed in my life is this community. Because all of us have inspired each other. Because all of us have worked together 
And when the person who is just up here asking what can we do, well, you start forming across your state, that's what you do. You take all the grassroots and you start working together because that's what we did in Pennsylvania and it's starting to work. We have campaign after campaign after campaign now that's coordinated across our states through grassroots efforts. We don't get paid for it, we don't have money for it, but we do it with social media, we do it online. We do it because we have no choice, like Josh said. This is our lives, this is what we're fighting for, our very life. So thank you all so very much for doing what you did and being brave enough to stand up. And thank you for doing what you do all the time, we all know. And thank you, Jason, for being an ordinary person that stood up. I am so proud of you. I want to tell you, I am so proud of you. I'm from Pittsburgh, and I stood and sent them off on their way. I, I didn't think those legs would make it. <laughs> but I am so proud of you, and I am so proud of Jenny. This is a grassroots extraordinaire right here, and this is what I'm talking about. You don't need money, you don't need big organizations, you just need people to give a damn. And that's what we got, is a room full of that today, so I can't wait to march with you all tomorrow. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs> um, uh, well, first I want to thank you all for being here and for all your work. Um, my name is Matt Ternoga. I'm a, a resident of Maryland, Prince George's County. And I had a, uh, I guess, sort of a lay of the land, partially lay of the land, partially tactical question, um, which I'm sure, I, I walked in a little bit late from the, the first speaker, and I you know, heard you talking about uh, the impact, you know, to your way of life and continuing, you know, to, to the farm. And, um, you know, a lot of situations that I've read about in the paper when it comes to fracking is the impact this is having on, on, on farmers. And I just, you know, wonder, um, from an organizing standpoint, how um, w overall, where the agricultural community, small farmers, even you know, lar lar I would think large scale, you know, farmers, um, you know, how much, I guess, mobilization or effort there, you know, is to stop fracking from that angle? Because I have to think that, and I don't know if they're just if it's picking off farm, you know, one farm here, one farm there, or if uh, I guess even agribusiness or just. Uh, you know, mid middle scale farmers, whether they see that really as a threat, a broader threat than just here's one farm here or one farm there getting picked off. And in, in these states and in these communities, you know, how that's playing out in these battles, I guess. I just want to thank uh, Frida, who had to leave early. Let's recognize and thank Frida and John. <laughs> I know there's several large farm organizations that have come out against fracking. PASA is one, Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, I know a lot of my customers, um, you know, when I was appealing the, uh, objecting to the permit, you know, they wrote letters, sincere ones, that they would not be interested in buying food so close to an industrial zone. I know milk production is down where there's uh, in communities where there's a fracking and leasing and, uh, I, you know, food is at risk. And I think uh, when, when the uh, landman came, uh, my neighbors are Amish, you know, and they said, here's a hundred bucks if you sign today. And they signed today because they were only used to those shallow gas wells. And I think a lot of farmers are in deep regret, you know, for being, for, for trusting people. And um, there, you mentioned PASA uh, that came out against it. There was also um, a study that was just done recently by Pittsburgh Law School um, that was paid for by Blackberry Meadows Farms, an organic farm in Allegheny County, just north of Pittsburgh. And they specifically quoted in counties in Pennsylvania where there's over 100 wells drilled, they have a 17% drop in milk production. So there are numbers out there. The name of that report is Risk to Farmers Who Frack. And if you go to Blackberry Meadows Farm, their website, you'll be able to locate that. And it's a very detailed and thorough report. Where we're from, we don't necessarily, it's not the kind of farm that you would think of where there's vegetables growing in the fields. And we grow the hay that feeds the cows 
that raise the calves that you guys order a steak from. So it's a roundabout way, but the impacts have been huge for us. And you don't even have to have a fracked well for this to happen. We've had production equipment leak. Where two years ago we lost 14 calves in one night from triethylene glycol leak. So it has really brought the people together in our community that are directly impacted by the oil and gas happening on their farms. These are family farms and ranches that are supposed to be passed down. People work for generations to establish. But we're also seeing the fracturing of our communities because there's people who live just right outside the gas fields that have been recruited, I guess would be the best words, by the gas company to speak on their behalf. And they're ardent supporters of industry because they get some money thrown their way, they get the benefits, but they don't have any gas wells in their front yards or in their fields. So it has served, as we've talked about, the destruction of the environment and of our food chain is terrifying, but to lose relationships with your neighbors that you've had for years. What we've done to combat this is you've gotta go sit eye to eye with people and you gotta to talk to them. And hopefully, we can do something that a lot of this the politicians in this country forgot about is we can compromise. We can tell them our story. We can try to, to reach out to them and let them know why it's so important that we stand up for ourselves. Some are willing to listen and some aren't. And that's one thing that I've come to realize with this. You're never going to change everybody's mind. But if we can get a movement going, you know, if we can get the majority of people to realize how important all this is, and that if we lose it, there's no getting us back. We've got to stop this now, and we've got to change our way of life. And I'm going to give you an example. In our part of the country where water is scarce, we used windmills for years to pump water for cattle and stock. And most kids my dad's age and my granddad's age tell these stories about having to climb a 70-foot windmill tower to grease a windmill, you know, and how they hated it. And what killed the windmill around us was cheap petroleum. People got used to cheap petroleum. They could go out and start a pump. They could pump their water that way. You know, so we've, we haven't evolved, we devolved in a lot of these areas. So Bill brought up a very good point. If petroleum products, if coal-fired electricity becomes so expensive and so inconvenient for people, the people that don't realize what's right in front of their face are going to be swayed by that and things will change. We just have to push them in that direction. So it's so hot and this panel's been going on so long, I'm sure the only people left are members of the oil and gas industry. <laughs> so just, or maybe just that guy with the, with the flip cam. Um, <laughs> um, you can vouch for him? All right, we'll take a voucher. All right, so, but you're gonna go on record for that. So, um, I wanted to just close um, by saying how much I love Dana Dolney from Pittsburgh, but also, thank you Dana, but also just to say, this, I've been watching this build and grow and build and grow from the time when we had, you know, 15 minutes of, of this Wyoming section that we showed on the back of a truck on the side of the Delaware River, you know, and going out to see oil and gas accountability project in Colorado that had been organizing there for five years before anybody on the East Coast had ever heard the word Marcellus Shale, right? Or longer than that. So I just want to say thank you so much to the organizers of this event and for tomorrow, because um, it means a lot to do this, right? So can we give them a round of applause for, 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 for Jennifer and for Gwen, for Texas Sharon, for everybody else who, who worked on this. But I also want to say that we're, we are nowhere near where we need to be, right? And we're going to have, I'm sure, we're going to be back to D.C. as much as people love coming to D.C., right? The capital of gridlock and shaking hands and lobbying breakfasts and America. And, 
But I also want to say that we have other, we have things that we're rolling through, right? We're going to try to hit a different state capital every month. That's the plan, right? We were in Ohio last month. It was unbelievable. Who was there? People who were there know. We flooded into that capital rotunda and made a sound I'm sure they haven't heard in there in a really long time. That place was loud. That was the people's house that day, that was for sure. Now, we're here in DC in July. We're gonna be in New York in August. And I know a lot of you know, I've been a little bit focused on New York because I think it is strategically important to the rest of the nation. It's not just because half of the time I live in New York. It's because I think it's incredibly important if we want progress in Pennsylvania, if we want progress in Wyoming, if we want progress in Australia, we've got to win in New York. We cannot lose in New York. We have a chance to just win, let's win. So show up in New York. End of August, August 25th, 26th, 27th. The idea here, Sandra Steingraber has written a Pledge of Resistance. I don't want to out her too much, but it's brilliant and it's amazing. We're going to do simultaneous rallies in Albany and in New York City. Sign that pledge. There's going to be a concert with some of those folks from Artists Against Fracking. We're working all the details out now. I can't tell you much more because there aren't any. There isn't more. We've got to get back on the phone and figure it out. End of August, New York, and shale gas outrage in Philadelphia is on September 20th is going to be amazing. The last one was incredible, it was 2,000 people. It was to, to date the largest fracking rally, I think, something like that. They edged out Pittsburgh by four people. So, you know, good to have those rivalries, but let's make each one of them, what's that? Yeah, in Australia they had, they had, in Australia, they had 9,997 sheep and three people. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I love you guys, you know how much I love you. I toured your whole damn country. I'm, I'm just kidding. No, in Australia they always have to win, so we'll let them win. They had 10,000 10, people, how can we let them win? They only have 12,000 people in the whole country. They have 10,000 of them, the other 2,000 are in parliament. We have to beat them. We need at least 10,001 people tomorrow and in New York and in Philadelphia and then wherever it is afterwards, everywhere. Thank you, Julie. Okay, so you got the message. Here we are tomorrow, DC, September, August, how does the calendar work? August in New York, Feb, September, I'm just done, done John. September in Philadelphia.